so that was um, actually the backdrop for my um, presentation was it was actually a picture a photo I took in Desolation Sound in the summer and I was interested in you talking about the asterisms because I was going to point out that what I did was I just uploaded that photo to astronomy.net and it just came back with all the constellations filled in it's plate solved it automatically which I thought was a bit cool but it um, would um, be quite interesting actually if someone could write a program that sort of give you an option to select different cultures and come up and see what alternative uh, asterisms there are. Um, anyway, the, the genesis for this presentation came about as a result of a discussion that we were having um, about the, the moons of Jupiter actually, and the fact that um, you could use those for telling the time when they were, <clears throat> and I pointed out they were used for uh, navigational purposes and I it occurred to me that when I was taught celestial navigation which actually about 50 years ago um, by Commander Ransom in that book um, the first thing he said was you don't need to know anything about astronomy and, and that's true you can navigate um, simply by looking up the tables and following through worksheets it's a bit sort of like doing long division you don't really need to know how it works so you just come up with an answer so I thought it'd be quite interesting since astronomy has uh, played such an important role in civilization throughout the ages um, to, in terms of the movement of people, obviously, and, um, and uh, commerce to, to look at it a bit more from the astronomical point of view. So I started um, looking at the um, Polynesians um, who were pretty amazing in terms of what they could do. And I'm just focusing not on, they, they had all kinds of techniques, which actually are in some references I include later, but I'm just focusing on the uh, astronomical side. Um, they <clears throat> memorized vast, about 200 stars and uh, the characteristics, particularly uh, the rising and setting points, which at any given latitude, <coughs> obviously give you um, direction. And so they would uh, follow a star. Um, and then, you know, when it gets too high in the in the sky, then they come to another one and then follow that one uh, and so on. So they give them a sense of direction. Uh, they also use circumpolar stars. So um, as we'll see in my next uh, slide, um, circumpolar star, stars that are just uh, circ circumpolar um, have, a, have a, a declination such that the sum of the declination and the latitude is, is 90 degrees. So if you know, if you're watching a star, it just touches the horizon. Um, the next night it doesn't, you know whether you've gone north and south, so it keeps them on their latitude. Um, the celestial equator, they always rise east and west. Uh, Mintaka in the belt of Orion is on the celestial equator. So uh, that was another one that they use. And also the other one, which I, I thought was quite interesting, and that's my grandson did, I asked him to do a little uh, illustration for me. Uh, they made use of the fact that, so they knew that certain stars reach their cul culmination at the zenith over certain islands. So it's sort of kind of a little bit like hanging a lamp over the island and saying, here it is, which I, I thought was quite, quite neat. Um, and that's, um, yeah, to so, so show you how, how, if you look at it um, from the point of view of the Earth, um, the horizon basically is the normal, the plane normal to the zenith. And if you look at the celestial equator, which is plane parallel to the Earth's equator, you can see the declination and the latitude will always add up to 90 degrees. So that, that's, a, that's another way of memorizing which stars just touch the horizon and then you could work out the different latitudes. And then we come to the Maori star compass, which I referred to in the introduction. And there they, they have the different, they've divided the um, 
stars, the rising and setting points into 32 houses. And of course the sun would change with the um, different times of year. And so that would give them all without instruments and a, a way of uh, finding their direction. And I've given a couple of, a, a couple of references there, which, or well, three actually, um, that give a very thorough explanation of um, how the star compass, how they use the star compass. Um, north and south, where it's pretty straightforward in the northern hemisphere, so we know the Polaris uh, lies within um, about one degree of the celestial pole. Um, the southern hemisphere um, is a little bit more tricky because there's no bright star. There is a star at the southern celestial pole, but it's not very, it's not very bright. Um, so you have to get it either by um, projecting the line from gay crux to a crux four and a half times, or there's a couple of uh, pointer stars, um, which you could, which if you bisect those, it'll meet the celestial pole. And that actually is also a photo I took in Australia. <laughs> so, um, so celestial navigation basically depends on the fact that for practical purposes, stars could be considered to be in fixed positions on the celestial sphere, uh, which is celestial sphere here. Um, uh, it's sufficiently far away so that parallax can mostly be ignored, which is why you can just shift the plane uh, from the uh, plane of the observer to the, through the center of the earth. And it doesn't make any diff practical difference to the angles. And also the fact that pre predictable events occur at the same time in every point on the earth's surface. And that's what we were talking about with the, uh, the moons of Jupiter was that, um, you can, if you know the time at Greenwich, at the Greenwich Meridian, that a particular moon will occult, um, <clears throat> and then you measure that time uh, somewhere else on the Earth's surface. It gives you it gives you the time at uh, Greenwich, which effectively gives you your longitude. So, um, for navigational purposes. Um, the celeste, the star's position on the celestial sphere, which is here, um, is defined by its declination, which is essentially the latitude, it's just the same as it is in ordinary astronomy, and the sidereal R, R angle, which is different from uh, right ascension that you use in astronomy. So the sidereal R angle goes um, westwards from the um, it's a vernal equinox, which, which is here. Um, I don't know if you can see my uh, diagram. Um, and <clears throat> the, um, so if you know, if you look, the, the nautical almanac will give you the Greenwich hour angle of Aries, or I, I, the, the, the um, point on the, the, the vernal equinox. Uh, where that is relative to the prime meridian at any particular moment. And then if you, you look up in the tables, the sidereal R, R angle of the star, you add the two together and you get the Greenwich R angle of the star. Um, so, um, well, as you know, again, going to come to talk to, uh, talk about uh, longitude a bit um, later, but I, I thought first we'd uh, talk about instruments. So um, from ancient times, um, they, used, they had an astrolab, which was in fact um, quite a sophisticated computer. Um, it was a mechanical computer, but it was a computer and it, um, it gave um, a lot of information, uh, astro astronomical data. Uh, but the uh, nautical one uh, was a very much simplified version, um, and it's it's basically just a ring here. I, 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 this is just a miniature one, <laughs> which I have. 
this is a miniature one of Champlain's astrolabe, um, which has a pointer on it, and you just hold it up, um, and then you rotate the pointer until it's aligned with the star, or the North Star, if you're trying to get the uh, latitude. And um, if you're obviously, if you're looking, obviously you don't look at the sun, so if you're doing it the sun, uh, you just turn the pointer and you look at the shadow and you get the shadows lined up uh, and then you can read off the angle. And this, this was used extensively in the, the Middle Ages. Um, but the, uh, the game changer uh, was the sextant, uh, which um, was invented in the mid 18th century. Um, and the sextant really, uh, there's two main features of it. One um, is that um, you can use it on a, a moving ship because the um, horizon and the star moved together. Um, and also uh, you, can use it, you can use it to measure angles between two objects, which is important when we come to talk about longitude. And I don't know if you can see my sextant here. Um, does that work? Oh, can you see that? Um, so um, basically, you've just got a, a telescope uh, that looks at a half silvered mirror here, which then this side, this side is silvered, so it reflects up to this mirror which then looks up at the star. And so what, what you see in the telescope um, is the horizon on, on this side and the star on that side. And you just move the well, you <coughs> index until uh, the horizon. It doesn't matter if the sort of thing's moving up and down um, until the horizon lines up with the star. And then you read at the Savonian scale here, which reads to uh, 10 seconds of the arc. And you read off the altitude of the star. So that was, um, and that can give you a precise um, latitude, because if you look at my, again, my little diagram here, you can easily see why um, the, altitude of the uh, North Star is equivalent to your latitude. Uh, it's just simple geometry. Um, and, and also <clears throat> you can do it from the sun if you know the, the declination of the sun, obviously. Um, so noon sites. Um, that will give you um, the um, uh, latitude, but you can also get the longitude um, as long as you know the time, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Um, the problem with getting the longitude from time is that uh, the sun takes about two minutes. It seems to hover for about two minutes at the apex. Uh, and two minutes is half a degree, which is uh, 30 miles at the equator or about 50 nautical miles at our latitude. Um, so you can see that's not very accurate. And, and what you have to do actually is to take a reading before uh, the, the culmination and then after, and then average the two. And you should still be able to, you should be able to get to that, um, 10 nautical miles, but it's, it's not, that, that, that's actually quite difficult. Um, so the other um, thing to do with a sextant is take a, uh, a star site, and as I, as I say, when you learn celestial navigation, or at least when I was taught it, you're just told to look up things in tables and add things to other things and subtract them. The question is, what are you really doing? And um, what you're doing is solving a spherical triangle, because if you look at my little globe, um, the, uh, your, your position on the 
celestial sphere is essentially your zenith that you can just project up till you hit this imaginary celestial sphere and the the the, the angle this angle between the pole and the zenith is what's called the local, local r angle which is just the amount that you have to turn the, the sphere to get from where the star is to where your zenith is and some again fairly straightforward well fairly straightforward it's vector maths if you if you know the altitude uh the declination rather of the star you can calculate the uh altitude by solving a um a spherical triangle um and um I, I say in practice what you do is you Assume a, <coughs> assume a position, work out, work out what the altitude of the star is for the assumed position, uh, set that on the sextant, uh, look in the sextant, that's why you don't really have to know anything about astronomy, because then the star will appear in the telescope, and then you just adjust it, that you fine tune it to get the star actually on the horizon. And then you calculate what is called an intercept, which is basically just gives you the difference along the azimuth line between where your assumed position is and where your actual position is. Uh, so, um, and then, yeah, so the, the um, they have all these complicated site reduction tables, as they're called, but really all they are um, is just a transformation between one set of coordinates and another. They transform from um, equatorial coordinates to all azimuth coordinates, which uh, basically is just a case of solving that spherical triangle, which you can actually do with a, a calculator. You don't need uh, the tables are merely just uh, pre-computed uh, results. So now we come to uh, this gentleman by the intriguing name of Sir Cloudsley Shovel. Um, so the beginning of the 18th century, um, the problem there was a huge problem in, in determining longitude because they didn't have accurate clocks. Um, so Cloudsley Shovel, he was Admiral of the Fleet and he, uh, during the um, War of Spanish Succession, uh, he's, he was charged with the task of um, blockading Toulon, the port of Toulon in uh, Southern France. He had the fleet of uh, 15 uh, warships and um, on the way back he ran into a storm in the Bay of Biscay and um, through actually bad seamanship uh, because he should have waited out the storm he, he decided to he tried to make the port and ran into the Scilly Isles he lost four ships and over uh, 1400 uh, lives, including his own, but because he was a member of the nobility, they weren't. They did the sort of establishment weren't going to blame it on him, so they blamed it on the inability to uh, determine longitude. And as a result of that, they set up. That was in 1707. They, they set up the board of longitude, which um, offered a prize of twenty thousand pounds, which is millions of dollars in today's money uh, for anyone who could uh, develop um, a, a, a method of reliably uh, measuring longitude to an accuracy of half a degree at the equator 30 nautical miles um, and that was basically a problem um, of, of how to keep accurate time at sea. And uh, the prevailing view uh, at that time was that it was simply not possible because the only accurate clocks they had were pendulum clocks. And obviously pendulum clocks 
uh, don't work on a heaving ship. So the, that most of the 18th century, um, you know, was devoted to this problem. Um, and there were two uh, approach. One was um, to somehow develop a sufficiently accurate clock that would keep the time at sea, uh, which a lot of people at the time um, reckon was impossible. And the other was to make use of predictable astronomical events. Um, one is the uh, transit of the moons of Jupiter because they, they, are, they, they, they move in predictable orbits and those could be tabulated. Um, but the problem with this method is it's very hard to um, observe the moons with any, or transit with any accuracy uh, on, a, on a ship. And, and I mean, Richard Corbett um, discussed this in his article, which I referenced there. And then the other uh, approach um, was, uh, which was favored by some people, was um, to um, measure the um, angle between the moon um, and with a sextant and um, a known astronomical body, which is on the ecliptic. So it could be the sun or it could be uh, a star. Uh, but the problem there is that uh, the moon's orbit is very hard to predict because it's the three body problem. You can, from the law of gravitation, you can predict very precisely the orbits of two bodies. Uh, there is no analytical solution uh, to the three or more body problem. I, now it can be done numerically with computers, but obviously they didn't have uh, electronic computers in those days. So. So that was um, a problem uh, during the 18th century, and there was uh, two uh, there was competition between the, the mathematicians um, and the artisan um, John Harrison, who um, <clears throat> was a Yorkshire. He was a car originally a carpenter uh, turned clockmaker, um, and. <clears throat> He, um, he actually comes very, um, basically from where my grandmother uh, comes from and her name is also Harrison. So I wonder if there's a connection, but I, ha I haven't managed to find, find one yet. Um, but he was um, initially successful and de he designed a, a spring uh, uh, that used to counterbalance springs clock. Um, and uh, took it on a voyage to Jamaica. And he actually uh, met the requirement, <clears throat> but um, there was a lot of politics involved. Um, <clears throat> he wasn't, uh, he was a mere uh, carpenter. He was, um, uh, actually his, his first attempts were made in wood, but it's his actual first clock that he put on a sea trial wasn't. Um, anyway, he, he, um, he, he met the requirement that the Board of Longitude wouldn't give him the prize because they sort of kept finding, making excuses and saying that um, he, uh, it was luck or, uh, and then another excuse they used was it had to be a practical uh, method and his clock was too expensive. Uh, actually, his clocks cost, I think, more than the ships almost at that time. But anyway, he, he um, he eventually succeeded um, and he eventually got his prize, but only after he'd personally seen um, uh, King George III. And the, there's a very interesting book by David Sabell, which I put there, um, who, um, uh, and, and also there was a movie starring, a TV movie starring um, Jeremy Irons and uh, Michael Gambon, uh, which is extremely good. Um, you can get it. I, I, I got that picture off Amazon, so it is uh, available, but it, it uh, sort of chronicles the whole uh, story and the, the intrigue that went on um, in uh, his development of the clock and um, his sort of unacceptance by the establishment, because he was just a, considered a mere carpenter and not a member of the 
worshipful company of clockmakers. Um, he was also, I, this was nothing actually to do with his um, marine time keeping pieces, but he was, he did claim that he could make a clock that would only lose, would lose less than a second in a hundred days, um, which he never in his lifetime <coughs> had the opportunity to make. But in 2015, um, <coughs> someone made a replica of, uh, to his exact specifications <coughs> and it was found to lose five eighths of a second in a hundred days and entered into the Guinness Book of Records um, 250 years after his death as the most accurate uh, pendulum clock ever made. So, um, and those are his clocks. That was the first one, H1, which actually met the requirements but didn't get the prize. And it uses sort of um, swinging balances. But the one that actually won the prize was H4, uh, which sort of looks like a pocket watch, which actually was ridiculed at the, in, in, in the day because they thought at the time that, uh, you know, pocket watches weren't accurate timepieces. They were sort of useful for day-to-day -day chores, but they weren't um, uh, chronometers. But he uh, sort of developed it. It's got a lot of innovative features, a bimetallic strip, and there's all kinds of uh, mechanisms, which I'm not really that familiar with. But um, and another feature was it ticked five times a second. So it had, with a large balance, so it had a high energy, uh, which made it um, uh, less susceptible to uh, perturbation. Uh, so the other, the, 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 the intrigue was there's, there's this competition between the mathematicians and, and the artisan, um, uh, John Harrison. Um, because the, 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 a lot of people thought it wouldn't be possible to um, uh, develop a mechanical uh, clock of sufficient pre precision. Um, and <clears throat> the reason <clears throat> I say there is that the moon, it has a very complex motion. A, it has a, a period of over 18 years because of the interaction, obviously, between the, the three bodies. Um, and um, some of the best mathematicians of the day, Euler, Poincaré, and Lagrange, uh, were all working on it. And finally, in 1755, um, there's a German astronomer named Tobias Mayer, and reportedly, with the help of uh, Leonard Euler, of uh, the famous uh, e to the i pi equals minus one, probably the most famous uh, equation in all the mathematics. Um, he, he, he produced a set of tables which, which worked um, to the uh, necessary precision. Um, and that is um, a chart of Captain Cook's second voyage uh, on the resolution in, Christ, in um, Christmas 1774. Um, he took with him actually a copy, it was called K1, it was actually a copy of Harrison's H4. Um, and <clears throat> um, that is the actual um, journal of the navigator, which you I probably can't read. Um, but he says he goes, ashore, he, he, goes, he goes ashore, he sets up an observatory because obviously even the method of lunar distances is hard to do on a, on a moving ship. But um, what they would do is they go, go up ashore, or go ashore, set up an observatory and then check the ship's chronometer. And he found it was um, uh, <clears throat> only a, a, a few seconds. Uh, what's it? Um, a few, yeah, it was, it was about 18 minutes difference. Um, he, he actually gave the, the longitude in degrees, which the Greenwich hour angle would be going west. So in, in those days, they must have measured longitude all the way around going east. But um, that, that is the actual, his actual handwriting reporting, going ashore, uh, taking, setting up an observatory and taking, uh, making lunar observations and then um, checking the accuracy of the ship's chronometer. Um, and then finally, I thought we'd 
uh, look at GPS because it's not, um, it's sort of astronomy, but it's, it's an interesting uh, comparison uh, because um, um, astronomy is all about angles um, and GPS is all about distances. And if you obviously, if you try to measure distances to the stars, you'd have a rather long wait and you'd probably get a, an accuracy within a few light years, which wouldn't uh, be very helpful. Um, but the GPS is a sort of similar principle. Um, the constellation of 24 satellites in um, medium Earth orbits, 20,000 kilometers up. So they, they orbit about once every 12, 12 hours. They're not geosynchronous. Um, so they don't appear stationary, contrary to the stars, which do appear stationary. Uh, but they each, um, they each carry an atomic clock uh, that's accurate to within a few nanoseconds, which is a billionth of a second, uh, which you can compare uh, with Harrison's clock, where he was looking to try <laughs> to achieve an accuracy of a second a day. Um, so anyway, each satellite <clears throat> sends out a coded signal. It's um, code division multiplexed, um, containing the time and the ephemeris data um, to, that enables the receiver uh, to compute the distances, knowing the speed of light and triangulate to get a fix. Um, well, there's a, an interesting little twist actually, but because, because the, uh, the, the receiver obviously can't have an atomic clock in it, uh, being practical. Um, but as long as the um, receiver's clock uh, is stable over the measurement time, um, the um, discrepancy just becomes an offset. So if you add another satellite, um, what happens is you uh, the delta T becomes an unknown, and then you can, you've got three equations instead of two, you just solve for the delta T. So that's how the receivers manage with just an ordinary uh, crystal oscillator. They don't need to get to um, an atomic clock. Uh, but it is, it's extremely precise. When you have to, when they, the, the, they measure the, um, when they take into account the time, they actually have to take into account time dilation due to the fact that the satellite's 20,000 kilometers up uh, due to the theory of general relativity, the time dilation in a lower gravitational potential. And um, finally, yeah, I said, and the, 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 um, the, the actual system is a, is a lot more complicated. It uses the Viterbi, Viterbi algorithm to estimate the best, get the um, best estimate from as many satellites as it can uh, get its hands on. Um, and that, um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. So I just, totally, just checked. Totally out. incredible, wonderful, wonderful presentation you know it's like taking a student from a to z in one move <laughs> in a short time everything measurable nothing that's refutable well it's it's, uh, it's a, <clears throat> actually a fascinating story i mean there's a lot more intrigue that went into behind it Yeah, the, the Longitude book is a fascinating book. I remember reading that a couple of years ago. Well, it's it, well you should see them. It's a very good uh, movie, actually. Yeah, I haven't it. seen the film, but yeah. I'll look out for it now. Yeah, it's a two part. It was a, I think it was on A&E &E at one stage, but I, I, I got that picture. I just looked to see if it was on Amazon and it was. I just, that's where I took that picture from. So I just want to make sure I got it clear uh, what, how the Maoris were using the stars. So basically, they understood that a certain star would rise on the horizon at a particular point, a yes. particular point of the compass. 
Yes. And then because uh, eventually it would get too high in the sky to be reliable, they would yes. have to have another star that came up. And so yes. they would just kind of use this kind of rolling sort of uh, mm -hmm. procedure to, to, to keep. And then sort of they, they'd say, OK, well, I'm, we're going to we have to be roughly 10 degrees to the north of, of that position. And then as the various stars rolled up, they would adjust to make sure they were going in a consistent direction. And, they were, yeah. and also, they, as they say, they've got the circumpolar stars as well, which should help to keep them on their latitude. Right. The other thing was you, you mentioned the, the, about a star kind of reaching its culmination over an island. So basically that, that was strictly a latitude, right? That would give them, they, they would know what latitude the, 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 um, the island was at because a particular star right. went directly overhead. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good for them. <laughs> I thought it was pretty <laughs> you, you also straightened me out on how a sextant works. Somehow I had this idea that a sextant had a kind of like a plumb bob or something like that. But, oh, no. well, it, and, and then, and, but it exactly, that would be what would make it impossible to work. It was, it was something where the person could almost like compensate for the wave, for the rocking of the sea. Um, be, as long as he's just keeping those two, those two star and, and horizon. Well, they fit right. together because they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's. Sorry. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was good. I think they do actually make sextants with with uh, an artificial horizon, but they they're not effective. I mean, because you can't. They just don't work. Yeah. They really you can only do it, but you know, twilight. Yes. Uh, see, during the Second World War, navigators had one where if you were in cloud, you had an artificial horizon that I, I had yeah. one that was donated to us that I gave to our new uh, telescope museum. Well, not, that, not as accurate, but it works. Well, I think, yeah, because they're, I suppose, yeah, I mean, they're moving very fast, so they're, they're probably not so concerned with accuracy. They can tolerate. Yeah. Uh, GPS has made these uh, exponentially easier to calculate. Well, GPS will give you time, but it is assuming that it's working. <laughs> so, I mean, you can get, you can get precise, I mean, absolutely precise time from, you know, to within nanoseconds to GPS, but, um, uh, you know, obviously if you're using, if you're navigating uh, celestially, you want to um, get, um, uh, you know, you want to be independent. Of, of, of. When when I use the GPS uh, chart plotter, I can go between two islands that are 100 yards apart, say, and there's a, an underwater hazard, and I can be assured that I'm missing that hazard because there's a little blip on the screen, and and my uh, trajectory shows that I'm not going to hit it. Um, as long as the GPS is working, I, it mostly does. But <laughs> yeah, right. I have an eye on it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I have, I have a chart plot exactly the same, but um, I don't 100 percent rely on it. I usually check the transits and things that I'm where I think I where it tells me oh. I am. Oh, we 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 have a depth sounder as well. So. <laughs> well, I have that too. But even though, I mean, some of the and there are places where. You know, that things come yeah. up pretty yeah. uh, quickly. And we still have missiles hitting the wrong village. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting when all these autonomous cars have all these GPS out running around too, see how accurate they're all going to be. Yeah, I hope they come on stream just um, just before I lose my license. Yeah, <laughs>